situation and then disciple them. Spend time with them. And that you can do that. And that's what we're doing. That's that's part of the great commission that God gave to his church. And that's one of the things I'm going to be preaching on tonight in church history is the commission. Who was it given to? We've been working on that for days. And uh, we're in about the 600s at that time. The 6th and 7th and 8th centuries. And we're going to go back because it's so important to know who the commission was given to. And for our church history goes. But remember, make, remember what we were talking about before the class, but make friends of man. Yeah. I've had so many people ask me that, but what in the world does that verse mean? I thought it was I, What? I thought it meant money. Breaks friends with rich people, influential oh. people. Because you can reach people a lot of times. Pudens and Claudia were really rich royalty. Pudens and Claudia are spoken of in the New Testament and Paul's writings. That was the basically in the they were the ruling class of Wales. The Roman Empire could never conquer the Welsh. They couldn't do it. They were a very small country. Too. Oh, it was a small country, but it was very hilly and, yeah. and everything, and the canyons and stuff. They couldn't spend the effort and time to conquer those people. So finally, they told the Welsh, well, it's not that we can't whip you. They didn't want to say that, because they could have, but they really put enough effort there, but they had a big empire to take care of. It's not that we can't whip you, but we would like to offer you Roman citizen, full Roman citizenship. Your men can join our army and fight for us in our Roman legions. And your royalty can be royalty also. And we will, you know, have these little democratic uh, republics that, that are part of the Roman Empire. And you can come in without being conquered. You can come into our empire and we're offering you this hand of friendship and uh, that you can be a co-citizen of the Roman Empire. And they did. And uh, that's how the gospel got into Wales. And by the way, the Welsh Baptists that were there many years later, it was a you know succession of, of people. England was reached. Ireland was reached. It, it's really weird how the gospel has spread throughout the world. How did Ireland get reached with the gospel? How do you know? How, how, what, how many of you know the history of that? I don't know if my wife does. She... I, we've talked about that quite a lot. How did, how did the, the gospel get to Ireland? Ireland was a, was a land of pirates and uh, rambunctious uh, heathers. <laughs> how did the gospel get to Ireland? We just uh, celebrated at Irish Day. St. Patrick's Day. Do you know who St. Patrick was? He was a Baptist preacher. Now, the Catholic Church will totally disagree with me, but the Catholic Church that was at that period of time they existed then fought Patrick. Patrick was an English Christian. He was captured by pirates, Irish pirates. And they took him into Ireland, and he was a slave. And he escaped, and escaped back to England after quite a few years. He went back to England, and God impressed upon his heart that he needed to go back to Ireland and preach to those heathens back there, the ones that had captured him. And he went. And he established over 300 churches in Ireland, 365, I think, if I remember right. Churches in Ireland. Now, the Catholic Church has him, has him establishing uh, 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 celibacy and... Uh, and these little uh, monasteries and things, baloney. He didn't do that. There wasn't such thing as celibacy back then. Catholicism had him done. And the Catholicism was fighting him because they told him he had no right to preach in Ireland. And he defended himself and, and of what he believes and everything else. And what he believed was Baptist doctrine. Baptist polity and, and everything. He believed in, in local New Testament churches. He established churches. They said he had no right to do that. He established deacons and pastors in all of those churches. He baptized over 100,000 people by immersion. 
That's how the gospel got to Ireland. Doesn't the Catholic Church recognize him? Well, no, they said that he's Saint Patrick to them now. Yeah. After he was, he after he made so much success there. Yeah. Finally, later on, after he's dead and everything else, they said, "Oh, he was a great Catholic priest." And they started bringing in all of these legends that he did. He chased all the snakes out of Ireland, and all kinds of crazy things. You know, uh, they attributed it to Patrick, but he was a Baptist. He was a Baptist. Grew up in a Baptist home and died a Baptist. But they, he, according to the Catholic Church, he was a Catholic. But he's, and one of their priests and a saint. Is there any history behind it? That he, you know, all that if, if you documented, uh, if you study Patrick's life, study yeah. what he believed, okay. study what he practiced, study how he did it, uh, study the opposition that he had in that period of time. Just study it and see what see what's going on. I was kind of wondering. My sister, she she's born a uh, day. Her name is Patricia. Mm -hmm. Her name Patricia. is Patricia. Yeah. Patricia. Patricia. Yeah, I mean, and uh, I was kind of worried about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah cause well, uh, study history and study what he actually believes and everything else, and you will come up. Matter of fact, I have a, a history right here. We're studying a little bit off of where we usually are. But uh, I'm placing here. I'll see what I can find out. This is all I have written down on page uh, 178 here. Talked about backing up on I say the British churches. St. Patrick was probably a Baptist by belief and everything. This is what historians say. Mm -hmm. All right about it. All of them say that he was probably a Baptist. Because he wasn't authorized by the Catholic Church. He didn't believe what the Catholics believed back then. He was being denounced for what he taught. Church in the Tennessee, establishing churches. They said that he established a diocese. No, he didn't do that either. All right, for the space of 40 years, the noted St. Patrick, a Briton, born, preached exclusively among the Irish, Scotch, and Britons. The time of his birth, even in the century uh, which he was born, is really unknown. It was probably the close of the 4th century. No certain data can be given concerning his beliefs, uh, but what he did believe is written down. Okay? But there's nothing... There is so much legend behind St. Patrick that you can't hardly be the legend from the truth. That's what they're saying. It can, however, be positively stated that he was not a Roman Catholic. <laughs> That's an absolute fact. And that he approximated in many things the doctrines of the Baptist. Okay, in other words, a lot of the work he did, it was... What he was doing was, was preaching Baptist yeah, doctrines. Yes. All right. That he was... And then it says here that ancient British and Irish churches, Philadelphia, 1894, argues at length that with much ability that he was a Baptist, he did not hold to the Roman Catholic idea of church government. And he ordained more than uh, one or more bishops in every church, and he did not believe in purgatory. He did not believe in transubstantiation. He did not believe uh, in the basic doctrines of the Catholic Church that the Catholic Church believed in. And yet they still recognize him. Well, it's just, that's that's how you rest history, and you rest the. Uh, Jesus said you rest the scriptures to your own damnation. People do. They rest history too. They rest history. The Catholic Church says that Peter was the first pope. Yeah. Peter would totally, absolutely disagree with that in every way, shape, form, because he was not he was not a pope. <clears throat> And they said that the Lord founded the church upon him. Peter said who the, 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 the rock that the church was founded upon was. He said it was Jesus Christ in his letters, in his epistles. All right. You ready to go back to the Old Testament now? Just a little bit of that. Thought I'd just throw that little bit of history in there. Yeah, but there must have been an awful lot of Catholic influence at the time he was teaching 
uh, and having those churches established for that legend to stick today? No. There was Doesn't it, Legends are legends. Um, Peter was not the first pope. Can you imagine in heaven today for people to say Pope Peter? What he would do, his reaction to such as that. We know that Peter wasn't the first pope. The church was not established upon Peter. Peter argues that in his own writings. But the Catholic Church traces their ancestry, their apostleship. See, their popes are apostles. According to them, they're, yeah. they're apostles. Apostolic succession, but yeah. succession, basically, okay? Their pope is an apostle, basically. Yeah. He is inspired of God, and he has continuous revelation what God wants for man to do in every age. And that's what Catholicism teaches, okay? And uh, that was not. Peter says that the Bible was our rule of faith and order, that people were inspired of God. Were inspired of God to write down the scriptures. And he was one of the people that, were in, that was inspired of God to write the scriptures. And he wouldn't believe in apostolic succession whatsoever. Do you think that he, he ever teaches the things that the... Uh, that the Catholic Church teaches today? Do you think Peter was guilty of any of that? And go back to, to St. Patrick's, Patrick's time. The things that they accused him of. He didn't believe, he didn't practice or believe in celibacy. All right? But they say he established celibacy. You know what that means? That means uh, denying sex and marriage and all that and living and, and establishing monasteries where priests and nuns would go and he didn't say that in his word. He, he, to my understanding, he said that, that he was, uh, that it's for him, for him, it's all right for him not to be married, but for others they can't. Paul. Yeah, Paul, Paul, Paul. Yeah, Paul said. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about Peter. Patrick. Oh, Patrick. 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 Supposedly, from by the Catholic yeah. Church, that he established monasteries, that he established the diocese system that he established uh, seminaries over there, and these seminaries were monasteries where the priests didn't marry. They were given over, in the, in, and this wasn't happening. He did teach. There were seminaries that he established, but the seminaries were not monasteries, as Catholicism says. So they took up what he did and just changed it over to meet their doctrines. The Catholic Church wasn't even practicing some of the things that they say that he was doing at that time. But they blame it on Patrick to get a license for it. And Patrick was a great missionary. How many missionaries do you know that have baptized 100,000 people, established 365 churches? Now, he was a great missionary. He did that. All right. Where are we in the, in the book of Exodus? 26th chapter? All right. We're in the 26th chapter, of verse 1. The last time we went on down. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to get everything here and try to, to teach you everything. The numerics of the scripture, I'm going to get a little bit of numerics of the scripture. What does numerics mean? Number. What? Numbers. Numbers. Numbers in Scripture mean a lot. Seven means what? Perfect. Okay, what does five mean? What does number five mean in Scripture? I'm going to give you a test here real quick. I'm going to throw a lot of terms at you. Well, what does five mean? No grace, uh, no grace is three. Six is man. What is five? Six, number six is man. Number five is grace. No, I have three is grace. Mm -hmm. Three is the triune God. The Trinity yeah, the of Trinity. the creation of God. Man oh, yeah. is created in Trinity. There are three heavens. All right. Um, so five is grace. Five is grace. Mm -hmm. And what three again? Three is a, is a, is a mm -hmm. triunity. Mm -hmm. The triunity. The tri okay. Okay. How God made his oh, things exactly. is triunity. All right. All of these numbers mean something. It says mm -hmm. in verse three, five curtains shall be joined one to another. And the other five curtains shall be joined one to another. And you shall make loops. All right, these curtains were, uh, well, all different kind of colors. And every one of the colors typifies something about Christ. White is, is what? 
Light typifies what? Purity. Purity, Purity and, and the sinless nature. Yeah. Red. Blood. Blood. Blood of Christ that was to be shed. Brown. Earth. Humanity. Earth. Humanity. Yeah. All right. Humanity. All right. And uh, purple. Royalty. Royalty. Blue. Uh, heavens. Okay. And Jesus was a... Uh, uh, Born in the heavens, he he had a heavenly. He was a heavenly. He was our heavenly Messiah. Okay. And if you go back into the American Indian art and culture, you're going to find the same colors meaning these same things. The Indians, when they uh, people say they worship the sun, did they? They you know how they had their they made their best. Yeah. Different those things. Did they? Did it represent something? Yeah, the colors. Do the colors represent? Uh, the colors represent directions. Directions. Yeah. Blue is heaven. Red, or reddish color, is the earth. All right, earth. And by the way, the the word for Adam means red. Earth. It means earth of earth or earthy or red. Okay, that's what it means. Uh, the 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 compass. It's the directions of the compass, what they call the medicine wheel. Okay? There's a medicine wheel. Let's look at it. And this is a medicine wheel. And you'll see some of these medicine wheels that are part of the wheel that are bordering on. And you ever I've think you've seen this? Huh? Seen you've seen this. All right. What does this medicine wheel teach? All right. The east. It's the color of, some of them, it's the color of reddish orange or yellow. Okay? Why? Well, the sun. That's where the sun comes up. And every day, I, I, uh, I have an Indian prayer that I pray with my daughter almost every time that I put her to bed at night. I'll kiss her on her forehead and on her chin, up on her right cheek and on her left cheek and on her nose twice. That's what I'll do, and I pray when I'm doing that. I'm praying the order of the medicine wheels what I'm doing. Uh, right. are, they, are, the, are, the, are there colors? Yeah, the colors. East is uh, it's basically yellow, sometimes reddish. Okay. And then west. What color do you think west is? It's gas. Blue? Ocean? Blue. Dark? Darkness? Uh, Darkness. Black. Okay. And then north. I got this thing all messed up here. Let's do it right. Yeah. North is supposed to be. Yeah. Okay, here's west. well, looking this way. East, east, east west, west, north, north south. south. Okay. East is yellow, a reddish orange yellow. West is black. Alright, I'm gonna go through this with you. North is white. One. No. No ice. ice. Okay. South is green. Because in the southern hemisphere, it's always green. The Indians didn't even know that. But they knew it. Why, why black for west? Because that's the, the darkest. When the sun it goes, goes down. down, it becomes dark. Oh, okay. And every man starts off in the east in life, but ends up in the west dead. Yeah. All right? And now, kind of in the middle here, you'll see a red color. I don't have the colors, but you'll see a red color and a blue color. All right? No, I was a little uh, thing that was told about when you put your bed face at ski. The, the, the Indians, oh, you've got all this stuff. I go with or come right. How about you? Oh, thank you. Uh, there was a thing, one time, a practice among early Americans. That when you had a bed, let's say, this is the bed, okay. I heard of that, too. Always face it, the, t the, the foot of the bed was supposed to be faced to the east. So you would see the sun rise. All right? All right? There's your toes sticking up there and your head up there. 
They always buried people in a grave. The graves, headstone like this, and the foot of that grave was always supposed to be pointed toward the east so they could rise up looking to the east. Because you know where the Lord's coming back? To the east, all right? In Jerusalem, all right? All of these little things that were handed down to us. Now let's go back to this medicine wheel thing and talk about prayer and colors, all right? I'll start off and I'll kiss my daughter's left cheek. And I'll say, Lord, watch over Dakota in the east. Always remember every morning when she wakes up, remind her that you are the God of glory, the God of heaven, the God that gives life to everything, the God that empowers all living things. And I'll go to the west, but remember also that all of us need death. And that we have this lifespan here, from here to here, to do what God wants us to do in our, for our lives. Go to the north. God, help us to have wisdom and renew our minds. Purge us from all iniquity. Cleanse us. The winter is a cleanser. It kills bugs. It does all kinds of stuff. It kills germs, the snow and things like that. And the, in the cold country, that's what it does. It purifies. It purifies the air. Huh? It purifies it in the air. Yeah. It kills, kills the flies. I used to like it when I lived up there in the cold country. They have any bugs in the wintertime. South. That's where the fruitfulness comes from. Remember that you are the giver of all life. The sustainer of all vegetation and trees. Indians say that the trees go to sleep in the winter and sleep all all winter long and wake up in the summer. And every year it was like one day with the tree. It's one day. Sleep and wake up. Sleep and wake up. Like that. Well, that God is the one that gives fruitfulness and life. And that whatever we have in life that we ought to share with others. And give our abundance to others to help them out. There's the four directions. And then I said, from the heavens above, I'll kiss her on the nose, I'll say, and God watch over her from the heavens above. The heavens above, of course, are blue. That's the abode of God. That's his primary abode. That's where his Shekinah glory is, okay? He's everywhere because he's omnipresent. But from the heavens above, please watch over my little daughter and keep her safe. And then on Mother Earth, where we all come from. Everything in our bodies are made up from the same things of this earth. God created man as he created the earth. All right? We're from the same substance. That substance sustains us. So God sustains us every day. And I, my wife keeps telling me, she said, Jim, write that down. Please write it down one of these days. And tell a story about it and get it in that little Indian book. All right? Well, anyway, that's that's the story of that. And these colors agree with the colors of the Bible. Kind of wonder how they came about. God, what does the word antediluvian mean? Don't say anything like <laughs> Well, anti, 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 against. anti the word anti is against, right? Yeah, or against it before. Antediluvian. Antediluvian is a deluge of the what? A deluge. What? Deluge. Like deluge. Like a deluge. Like That's it. Deluge. So the deluge is like a sprinkler or sea or, or, or water, isn't it? Yes. Anti water. To, to, to filter out. What? It's uh, before the flood. Before the flood. Oh, okay. Anti deluvian man. Before the flood, when everybody was all in one place at one time, uh, everybody spoke the same language and everything. They all knew each other. Then after the flood, man had problems again, didn't he? All right. What happened then? God told them to disperse, and they didn't do it. So they didn't disperse, the so he dispersed them. He changed yeah, the change languages. The languages. Change he confused language. the languages, and he divided the earth. That's what happened. He divided the earth. And all mankind actually knew God at one time. They knew the word of God. 
Oh, I got a question. And he told them to walk down, tread down the earth, and don't depend upon cities or anything. Don't build great cities and things, but just be nomads in the land, and I'll take care of you every day. And basically, that's what the American Indian did here in this, on these con in this continent. I have a question. When he um, confused the language, and they were all in one area, and they were dispersing, when he divided the earth, were they on that particular earth when it was moving? Yes. They were, huh? Yes. Lord have mercy. They moved along. They way. divided God. It was a miracle. This isn't the continental drift theory. We're talking about a miracle of God. The division of the continents, God says in the days of Pele, God divided the earth. All right? And when he divided the earth, these people over here knew some basic theology. Study of God and his ways. There were very few atheists among Indians. You didn't see anything like that. They all believed in God. They were all a close-knit family of people in the tribes and things that they were. And they taught these things were the basis of life. I've told the story many times of Travis Hubbard. And you've seen that little book I wrote. I think he even got one with me. I brought it to a, for a, one of the class members. Some place. It's around here. Here it is. It's a little book I wrote. The uh, Introduction to Thoughts and Customs of American Indian. When I first wrote this book, I gave a copy of this book to Travis Hubbard. He read it. He said, that thing is full of illustrations that we can use in pulpits and things all over. He says, full, full of everything. And he said, now I know what my father told me 70 years ago or more. 75 years ago, I guess. He, told him that. he said, my father was a missionary among the uh, Indians in Oklahoma. <coughs> the, uh, the Creek, I believe it was, the Creek or the Choctaw, I can't remember now, or Chickasaw. Anyway, he was a missionary among those people. And God tells us to live in faith and to live a life in such a manner that we trust in God. We trust in God. And to live a simple life trusting in God. He said, my dad went in there among these people and he was preaching Christ to them. And he said, I never forget. He said, in the churches, they were saying their hearts out to God. He said, the Indians in singing and our singing was so much different though because he said everybody would be singing a different part of the song. Indians sang a song about everything. They sang when they work. I remember my grandmother, when she went out working, she sang all the time. But originally, the Indian songs that they sang were praises to God. They were praises to God. Even the petroglyphs that you see on the stones and everything, those were prayers to God to protect the animals and to keep renewing the earth with these animals. I hear it part of the South, all right? And they were so excited every day about what God has going to show them and give to them that day. It was a, everything, ever, to an Indian, every day was a new world almost, a new, a new exploration. Find out what God has for me today. Well, that's what God had told man to do. Now, recently, I said how he told him to live like a child, like a little child. Remember what Jesus was telling him later on in the Gospels? Well, it was a simple way of life. And God told man to live that life, and he would not be encumbered by all the burdens of life. You know, Israel wanted a king like all the rest of the nations, remember? And he said, you'll have nothing but problems from now on if you get yourself a king. He's going to tax you. You're going to have taxes. You're going to be in his military service. All these things all the time, you're going to have around your neck like a like a millstone. But he said, that's what you want. I'll give it to you. I'll show you. <laughs> I'll learn you. <laughs> a hard way. Okay? Well, what God told these people were these basic Basic living patterns. And they lived this. They didn't say, I believe it. They believed it. And when Bradis Hubbard, M.B. Hubbard, went there, and he's buried 
Brother Hubbard's buried by him up there in uh, Modesto. I went to his funeral. His daughter gave me his Bible and everything. He's he's buried by him up there, and his sister, his family. But he said L.B. Hubbard was sitting there in an old wood stove, warming himself and just thinking and praying and everything. And Travis came in from school one day, and he, and he went in there, and he saw his dad just sitting there, wasn't talking, wasn't saying anything. And he... Uh, he told him, he said, Dad, what's wrong? He said, I'm really uh, having some problems here. I, I, he said, I thought that God wanted me to teach, preach to these Indians. He said, you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that we have done more harm to the American Indian than anything. We have destroyed them. We've to do is alcohol, lying, deceit, broken trees, right and left. He said, all we've all we've introduced to the American Indian is corruption. They know God, he said. They know him better than we do. They know him. They live for him every day. And we have brought him a bunch of corruption. He said, I'm not sorry that I preached and told him more truth about the word of God and God himself in person of Jesus Christ and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'm not sorry that I've done that. But these people are living their religion every day. They're living for God. And their whole essence, every cell of their lives, is pointing to a creator and believing in him. And he says, boy, what I have learned. He said, God didn't t t send me here to teach. He sent me here to learn. And Travis never understood what he meant by that until he read that book. He said, now I know what my father told me seven and a half years ago. Well, he did the same thing with uh, Moses and about, what, 40 years to learn? 40 years. Three in the Moses' life meant, was three 40-year periods of time. And 40 years yeah. also means uh, something in the Bible. 20, 10, 40, 12. And didn't, he, didn't, didn't he attend the herds, the sheep? He, uh, he herded sheep for 40 years. 40 years. He, learned how to, he learned how to maintain people, huh? Yeah, people are like a bunch of dumb sheep. <laughs> that, was, that was the whole message behind it. Yeah. Now do you understand just a little bit about this? Well, wife that I knew all right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Also, I too, I kind of, you know, because even in the wilderness, they, they lived in tents, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And, and Their lives were mobile. Yeah, mobile. And for 40 years, they roamed in, in the wilderness for 40 years. They, had, they lived in tents. Yeah. And, and what do the American Indians do? They live in tents. Most of them. Some of them live in, in villages and houses. But most of them, I mean... The biggest majority of them were nomadic. Yeah. Or at least semi-nomadic. Yeah. At it least seasonal. Hey, brother, the, the people that came out of uh, Egypt from under the heavy hand of Pharaoh, was, huh. it, was it millions? It was probably millions, yes. That many people he had to minister to. That many people Moses had to minister to? Yes. Man. How would you like to take yeah. care of a million people? Yeah. A million people. I don't want to tell my family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that was Moses' yeah. family. Yeah, but God, but this, but this, this is where God instituted the, the order of chain of command. Yeah. Get men to take care of these and take yeah. care of these. And okay. Yeah, that's, that's what's going on. Let's go on down here now. Look, now we know what these things teach. It said, Then you shall make curtain, curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle, and you shall make leather curtains in all. The length of each curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits. And the eleven curtains shall have the same measurement. Now we're talking about eleven curtains that were laid over this tabernacle here, okay? Here, here we have a... How many of you ever have a tent? You have a frame. Okay, and it has a frame. Now they got really neat ones that you can pop up and nothing flat, but I remember when it took a long time to put up a tent. Well, anyway, this was a rectangular tent, basically. And of course, I know that I did not draw it exactly right there, see. But they would lay all of these blankets over this tent. Now, it was standing up like this, all right? And staked down and everything and all these, and there was all kinds of little poles all around it like you'd have on any tent, a house tent or a cabin tent or whatever. And they would take these blankets and they would throw it over and they'd lap over. But the other, every one of them, since they were all the same length,
because the law of, you know, when you put one piece of cloth down and you drape it over something and you put another one exactly the same size, what are you going to see? The sharpness. It sharpens it every time and you can see a piece of the last one under here. So you can see a piece of these on every one of them. All right? You can see all the different colors on that tabernacle. And that was important. And you shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain, that is, as the outermost in the first set, and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain, that is, outermost in the second set. What is 50? 5 times 10. 5 is the number of what? Grace. Great. All right. You shall make 50 clasps of bronze. All right. What is bronze in the Bible? Brass. Judgment. 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 And you shall put the class and the loops and join the tent together that it may that it may be a unit. This whole tabernacle taught the ministry of Jesus Christ primarily. Secondarily, it taught things about the churches in the church age. Okay? Different aspects of the lives of the churches in the church age. All churches are made up of what? Individuals, man, the men, the color, you know, brown, wood, whatever. Okay, those people are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been our, our, our judgment has been put upon His shoulders. The judgment of our sin has been put upon His shoulders, so on and so forth. Okay, and then it says. Uh, Join the tent together, maybe in a unit, in verse 11. And the overlapping part of it is left over in the curtains of the tent shall the half curtain that is left over shall lap over the back of the tabernacle. And the cubit on one side and the cubit on the other side, what is left over in the length of the curtains, shall lap over the sides of the curtain on one side and on the other side the covering. That's what I was talking to you. Okay? And you shall make a covering for the tent of round skins. Dyed red. What does the red typify? Earth. Earth. And what? That's, that's what it typified in the American Indian culture. Now let's get back. Oh. Okay. Oh. What blood? The blood of Jesus Christ oh, is redemptive blood. Okay. I'm thinking Indian now. Okay, you're thinking Indian now instead of, <laughs> instead of the Bible. But the earth, the red. Jesus was our second Adam too, wasn't he? Of the earth. He came from the earth so he could redeem Christ was related to the creation, wasn't he? Jesus Christ was not only related to Adam, but he was related to everything in the creation because Adam was made from the same elements as the creation. Okay? So Christ not only redeemed a man, John 3.16, what does it say? For God so loved the man, the world, system of things, the whole world order. Who created it? God did. Was Adam created from the same elements as God created the earth? Same thing. Same stuff. So when Jesus became the second Adam, the Bible teaches that sin is not passed on through the woman. Sin, the nature of sin is passed on through mankind. The first Adam sinned. And we're all related to him because all of us are children of the first Adam. Therefore, all of us have the sin nature. But it didn't come from our mothers. It came from our father. Okay? We've talked about that. Not one speck of, of your blood ever came from your mother. It came from your father. Your blood comes from your father. And in blood carries life and carries death. Also, through the flesh of a woman, Jesus was born not of a man, but born of a woman. Through her flesh, he was related to all mankind and to the elements that make up the whole cosmos system. And therefore, when he died on the cross of Calvary, he not only redeemed the mankind, but he redeemed the creation. Back to him. He brought it back. You have to be related to something. Now, when he became mankind, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and God were able to feel as far as being a human being because he felt it. 
Yes. Nothing was ever done outside of the Father's. They are not three separate individuals. So when he died, they, they, one they, they kept they, they came When Jesus death. Christ died on the cross of Calvary, the loneliness in the flesh of Christ, Christ bore our loneliness, our shame, our disgrace, our sin on the cross of Calvary, but the Father tasted of it too. Because we have a triune God, triune. We don't have three gods. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God that manifests Himself in three ways. Three you are one person, Brother Levy. Even so, sometimes you feel like you're half a dozen. <laughs> but wouldn't it, wouldn't it be when, when your body is sick, your mind wants to do godly things sometimes, doesn't it? But doesn't it manifest itself in three three persons, though, right? Yes. Okay. Person, persons or personalities, whatever you want to call it. God is one God, but He's manifest in three aspects of God. You are the best way that I can explain it is how God is working. God said, I make man in my image. Alright. His shadow casting likeness, his blood flowing image, that's physical. Alright. In his eternal image, man became an eternal being when God created him. Now, I don't mean he was eternal from that point on, not Back, living back in eternity past. But from that time on, every human being that was ever born is eternal. You don't ever die, ever, ever, ever. You don't go out of existence, I should say. Your body dies, but your spirit never goes out of existence. And that spirit becomes a human being in the womb of a woman at the point of conception. That's when you became a life. God said he breathed into Allah, which means red, earthy. All right. God breathed into ha, the, the Adam, ha, Adam, the breathings, the breathings of well, life. But doesn't life start earlier than that? It's not, it's not during conception. I mean, as soon as the two eggs meet. Well, the sperm and the egg meet. That's and life that right there, right? Life. Life. That becomes a life. Now, if that, if that sperm and that thing dies, that goes to be with the father, right? If, it, if yeah, if that, after it meets, it becomes, it becomes, it starts to become a. If it's aborted, if it dies or is cast off by the woman in miscarriage or whatever, it's still a life. It has right. become a life. Okay, it's still a life. I believe all of those lives are with God. They're all in eternity. They will be people in eternity. Redeem the people. In other words, there would have been a spirit. There was a spirit established in that, in that age. Spirit of life. There was a, there was a human being in yeah. that age. Yeah. There was a triune being in that age. They were physical. They were spiritual. There was life. Okay. And it was eternal. And the spirit. And we have the Father, the mind, the soul, the spirit the life-giving force, and the Son, the physical expression of God. The physical, the material expression of God. Okay? The Greek, the, the, not Greek, but the, the American Indian, the Lakota language, in Lakota, that's Sioux. They have a name for the Father, which is Wakan Tonka. They have the name for the Son, which is Tonka Sheila, and this is, this is before white man, pre-white contact with they have the name for the Son, Tonka Shiva, and then they have the name for the Holy Spirit, Skan Taku Skan Skan. Skan Taku Skan Skan. The Son was in obedience to the Father. The Holy Spirit was that thing which gave all things life. That life that lives in all things. That thing that forever moves and exists and moves in us, giving us life, is from the Spirit God, Spirit God, hovered over the faces of the deep, it says, and reformed the earth that Satan had destroyed. It's, I'm after 12 o'clock, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. But it's, it's been fun today. I hope you enjoyed the class. And uh, please remember us in your prayer. Brother Levine, would you dismiss us? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for this day. For this class and this time about your word, Father, that we would take it with us, Father.